This is Randall's gradualist approach to catastrophism, right? You got to take it in stages. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> goes, a little bit at a time. That's right. Yeah. Well, see, I do believe in the value of the whole uniformitarian principle. Even to the extent where sometimes you realize, okay, uniformitarian explanations don't explain this. Okay, you're talking about look at this mid-continental feature that we can see on this on this map. This is quite amazing. Now, look at this dark green area. See that dark green? Area? That's the basin of Lake Agassiz. And if you look at that and realize that that is that's the basin of Lake Agassiz there. Look, it's bigger than Lake Superior. It's twice the size of Lake Superior. And if you follow this down, right here is the southern outlet. Let's see. We'll, uh, it should come into, there we go. Check this out. Here's the southern outlet right here. And it is coming down. And here's the bump. When I was a kid, whenever I saw a map of Minnesota, and I tell you what I'm going to do here. I'm going to make this transparent. We're going to look at a map of Minnesota. There we go. Look at the dashed line coming down. See, you got this pretty pretty uniform line comes down like this, and then it's perfectly straight between Minnesota and South Dakota. But then you got this bump right here, and I'm it bumps to the west. And I remember as a kid, I was looking at it going, what the hell is that bump? Of course, what I understand now is that the bump is a leftover relic of the deglaciation process because if we put the – we put the digital map back on. See that? Check that out. You see it? Is it working for you guys? You see the map? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. All right. It just so follows so the, follows that's the, the river border of Minnesota. Loop. We come back here, and what we see is it's a huge spillway coming out of the, the bottom end, the south end of Lake Agassiz, and flowing down and should come into focus in a second. There we go. There we go. Look at this. It's just as plain. You see how it's all coming down, focusing right into this area right here. And we come down here, and let's see. This is Big Stone Lake down here. Let's say I believe the big boulders that I took the picture of are it's either in this zone or this zone. Yeah, you were right with the first yeah, one there. okay. And check this out. Kyle, do you see any streamlined erosional residuals? Yes, sir, I do. Uh-huh. Yeah, right there, like an island in the stream. Yeah. Like a Look fish. at that, like a fish. There it is. That probably started out as a distributary, and then it eventually eroded all of that away to the yep. streamlined erosional residual. Oh, yeah. yeah? Uh, here we go. Look at, look, look at the texture of this. Look at these forms here. So I've just got I've got the same map. I just used a different layer. He's using a colorized elevation. Yeah. I used the scale. Yeah. Right. Yep. So we back out. We can uh, map nerds unite. Map yes. Cardophiles. Cardophile. Yeah. Yes. Both Brad and I discovered early on that we shared a mutual love of maps. We were um, obsessive. Cardophiles, loving maps. Now, check this out. Follow the pathway of that drainage, and that is the present-day Minnesota River Valley. Here comes the Mississippi right down here, and here's the Mississippi and Minnesota meet right there. And That turn down there is extraordinary, too. It's almost 90 degrees or maybe a little more. Where down right. here? Yeah. Yeah, and you know why that is? It got deflected around moraine. Ah, okay. See, look at all this hummocky, bump, bumply stuff. That's all moraine, see? Yeah. So what it did is it got deflected. In this case, it got deflected to the north, and it flowed right up here like this. And didn't you say that the, uh, the flow of the river in the wide channel was over 4,000 times the modern Minnesota River? Yes, that's what I said. River it Warren. I like it could be even more than that. It could be. That might have been a conservative. Yeah. But here I've gone ahead and I've, I've put, the, put the, the, the hydro information in so you can see very clearly the modern Minnesota River relative to the channel of River Warren. 
as it's called. River Warren was carrying a discharge 4,000 times greater than the modern Minnesota River. Now, people, I think, are, are now getting to understand how you'll notice these tributaries. When they're coming in from the flanks, once they're down in, the, in this mega channel, they're stuck there. They're not going to flow uphill and flow back out, see? So what happens is you have these underfit river conditions in all of these major river valleys around North America and beyond, and basically what they've done is they've captured the, the major rivers. Same Columbia River, you know, you look at the Missouri. We can look go up to the Missouri and we'll see the same thing. This underfit condition is the normal condition of most of the major rivers in North America. And see, we can follow this thing and right on back. The map is a little bit slow because there's a lot of data that has to be uploaded. But you can see this. It, yeah, here we go. So all of this is moraine out in here. This is the hummocky stuff that's left behind after the glacial retreat. So this moraine has kind of diverted the flow of River Warren up to the north. That's why it does this. But yeah, we can follow this whole drainage channel, this sluiceway, right on back up to um, to its outlet at um, right up here, which is um, Lake Agassiz. Well, the other thing I notice in that is that okay, so that deep green right there is the River Warren channel, right? Yes, that's the outflow. But yes. it's also sitting in a big, wide, flat, even larger feature. Is it yes, possible that that's right. And I wasn't even going to go there yet. Okay. All right. Because, you know, I was sort of saving that, Russ, for... Oh, sorry. Well, hey, man. You I'm just... Um, tonight. <laughs> I'm going to have to start briefing you guys, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> no, but I think a lot of people will have figured that out themselves by this point. Yeah, because we're seeing modern river. Okay, you got to get this now. Modern river scaling up. River Warren... Now we're going to scale up by the same order of magnitude again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're talking serious, wow. serious flows. Yes, indeed we are. Going back here. Yeah. So here is the, the outlet of Glacial Lake Agassiz. Here's the bump. And that bump is undoubtedly being directed around moraine, piles of moraine. So it comes down here, hits this moraine. And I forgot the name of this moraine, but it has a name diverts to the north, meets the Mississippi coming down here, and then this river is the St. Croix River. The St. Croix River forms the boundary between Minnesota and Wisconsin. Now, what you got a picture is we had a big flow coming down from here that follows the Minnesota, but we also had a flow coming off the superior lobe this way. And in fact, once the, once the map gets fully resolved here, we'll actually be able to see some streamlining going on here. Let me let me take off the hydro cache so you can see it more clear. You see this? You can kind of make out the, the oh yeah. It's it's low profile, but it's still there. It's still recognizable. And then you've got it. it the the form the flow becomes channelized, and here we have the Saint Croix River coming down. So let me. Go back to making this transparent so we can see. Yeah, here we go. Let's see. Hudson, Hudson, St. Croix. Let's see where are we? Lake of the Dolls. Yeah, here we go. Eight. Here we go. There's eight. Yeah, Lake Boulevard. There we go. Here we go. Uh, so now let me bring back, check this out. Call them St. Croix dolls. Well, that's just, yeah, the dolls. Hmm. Yeah. We find that over and over again. Um, and Kyle is going to look that word up for us and give us the origins of that. But this is this is a critical convergence point in this flow that was coming off the superior lobe from the direction of Lake Superior coming south. This was a flow convergence point right through right between this. There's a constriction here. This was like a venturi flume that concentrated the flow. Now, because of the conservation of mass, when you're thinking of a flow, you have to think of it as a sort of a stream tube. And if you take 
an, a, an inlet and an outlet of stream tube. Basically, as long as you've got uniform flow, the amount of water flowing in, into the stream tube has got to be the same as the amount of water flowing out of the stream tube. And assuming that there's no way for the water itself to exit the stream tube, the way that has to happen is if the stream tube is becoming constricted, the water has to speed up. Again, that's the same idea. So if you have a, if you have a channel with a smaller cross-sectional profile, in order for the same volume of water to flow through that, as they say, a section either upstream or downstream that let's say is twice the capacity, the water has to be flowing twice as fast because it's wanting to keep the same discharge. It's wanting to see, keep the same flow rate. So if it's flowing at, you know, uh, 50,000 cubic feet per second at this, at this uh, gauging station, it's got to be flowing 50,000 cubic feet per second at this gauging station, even though the cross-sectional profiles of the river channel at those two points might be very different. But if it's a tighter, more constricted cross-section of the channel, the water has to speed up. So when it speeds up, what happens? Well, for one thing, it may go from what's called laminar flow into turbulent flow. When it gets to turbulent flow, that's when it becomes highly erosive. And in turbulent flow, you get a lot of intense eddying processes. And as these eddings, if, if the, the pressure of the water is enough and it's moving fast enough, those, these eddies literally turn into the equivalent of an underground, underwater tornado. So what do those underwater tornadoes do? They do geomorphic work that leaves fossil features in the landscape. Okay, so dolls are uh, refers to the rapids in a narrow channel, ah, rock channel. The rapids in a narrow channel. That's so. That's exactly what we're talking about, isn't it? So no wonder they call it the dolls. The they dolls. take on board Texas. This is called it's D A L L E S, but it yep. can have various spellings. Like if we go over to Wisconsin, it's the Wisconsin Dells. But then along oh. the Columbia Gorge out in Washington, Oregon border, we have also the dolls. Right. But it's the same thing. D-A-L-L-E-S, not D-O-L-L-S. Oh, that's, yeah, that cut right there. This right yeah. here? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Well, that's Devil's Lake. And this was one of the overflows of Lake Wisconsin. Oh, okay. Wow. And called Devil's Lake because, you know, obviously people assume that it was cut by the devil himself. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, so this was an overflow. Excuse me, this was a, a, an overflow point, and so was this right here. And then this came down and formed the Wisconsin River. Now check this out. I mean, he, talk about another example of underfit rivers. See, I, I can show you yeah. example after example after example. I mean, look at this channel here. The modern river did not cut that channel. That's a relic of the catastrophic draining of Glacial Lake, Wisconsin. And then that flowed down here. So how recent is it that the geologists really got that? Oh, decades, 50 years, 100 years, or is it last no, 20 50, or 30? Uh, probably 50, I think. Let's see. If I go back, I think it was being figured out by the 50s and 60s. They were starting to get the picture, I think. All right. But yeah, I mean, look right here. I mean, this, this, this is an amazing place, by the way. This is uh, at the confluence of the Wisconsin River Valley and the Mississippi. This is Prairie du Chien right here. And a huge sandbar there. Is that what that is? This? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's erosional or depositional. I okay. think it's could be both. Right. But if I go and put in the hydro case, you'll be able to see. Here's the Wisconsin River coming down. Now, because of the flat gradient, there's all kinds of lakes on the floor of this big channel here. All right. It spreads out. Yeah. But, but of course, again, underfit. Underfit. So this is one of the dead giveaways when you see this configuration. Yeah, there were some extremely large flows happening once upon a time. So part of now the work that needs to be done is 
developing a, a, an accurate chronology. Like when were the flows? I mean, and how were they related to each other chronologically? That sort of that kind of work is just just beginning.